Who's pitching today? Oh, it's it is seven o'clock, so we will get started tonight. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I did notice that a few scouts walked in the room, and I was wondering if potentially our scouts might want to come forward and help me uh, help uh, run uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. If our scouts want to come forward. As a former scout leader, I'm, I'm impressed they're here, and thank you all for coming, and I would love for you to help help me. Just, just right, I think right, right there is fine. You can just do a horseshoe right around there. Sure. Or <laughs> flags behind you guys. Okay, yeah. this gentleman, the flag is right over here. You guys go ahead and start. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. What troop are you guys from? 91. 91, okay. Is that out of Village Presbyterian Church? Yes, I believe. Okay, uh, Dr. Henson, B1. Thank you, Mrs. Goodburn. We're going to start out with a video tonight, and then I'll introduce our student that's being honored and her mother that's with us tonight as well. So uh, let's go ahead and run the video tonight, please. Brenny Ma is a senior in the biotechnology signature program and one of the requirements for biotech 2 is to complete a research project. It's based on the knowledge that a lot of plant-based chemicals are able to treat diseases and so the goal for this extract is to be able to treat diseases without hurting the body in other ways. Renny was selected as one of the students to represent our area at the National Junior Science and Humanities Symposium and then she also received a grand award at the Greater Kansas City Science and Engineering Fair which qualifies for the International Science and Engineering Fair in May. It's been such an honor to be recognized, honestly, because I'm working on these things independently and it's very interesting to see all of these results and I'm very excited about these results, but when I can share it to the world, it's that much more meaningful. We're at the University of Kansas Medical Center, uh, specifically the Cancer Research Institute, and I'm working in Dr. Shahid Umar's lab with my mentor, Dr. Ishbak Ahmed. This has been an incredibly enlightening experience. Um, it's really an independent experience. I've learned a lot just from researching myself, from reading articles. I received help from my mentor, of course, um, but it's really different from learning in the classroom. I think this is very important for her career. She has shown that she can hold a project, she can do a project. I mean, she just took the training for a couple of months and then a later part she took on her own and she was doing everything independently. So I think uh, she is very bright and her future is really bright. Renny is fun, she's focused, she's intelligent, she's kind, <coughs> considerate, all those things that you would want your own child to be. The Shawnee Mission School District Biotechnology Program has been absolutely instrumental in my entire development. Mrs. Bott was the one who really prompted me to think about my interests and my passions. And also, all of the people that I get to interact with, um, my classmates, and then with the guests who come in, I'm able to see more of how the STEM field plays out in the real world. And I can see these different careers um, that I could go into. They've given me so many opportunities uh, and means to achieve success. Renny is here with us tonight, and her mother is also here. So, Renny, Ma, would you stand? And would your mother stand? Let's give them a round of applause for you. Congratulations on all of your accomplishments. We're very proud of you, and thank you for being here tonight as well. We appreciate it immensely. Someone asked a question uh, last week uh, in a group. Well, how well are our students doing? So let's talk about that uh, a little more in depth tonight. The Shawnee Mission North in JROTC has earned the title of overall national champion. 
as a result of their outstanding, outstanding performance for the 2016 NJROTC National Academic, Athletic, and Drill Championship. The Corps, led by Chief Warrant Officer Dennis Grayless, also was awarded the National Drill Champion title and overall National Athletic Champion title. This was the first overall championship title for the Corps. In 11 consecutive appearances, the Corps has earned 31 national titles in multiple events at the national championships. And again, this is the first overall national champion. So Shawnee Mission North High School in JROTC, the number one unit in the entire country. So congratulations, not only to our instructors, but to our students as well. You will see more of them at the May board meeting. I had an opportunity to uh, watch firsthand the, um, in the depth of their skill. Uh, you'll be very, very impressed uh, when they come to us. Uh, absolutely. You can see pictures of them uh, there on their screen. Dr. Craig Denny and his wife, the late Terry M. Denny, received the Order of the Noel Cardinal and Gold Award during the Distinguished Awards celebration at Iowa State University. You can see pictures of, of Dr. Denny. The honor recognizes individuals or couples who have provided dedicated and long-term service and creative leadership to the Iowa State University Foundation and Iowa State through the advancement of philanthropy. As we know very well, Craig and Terry Denny have made a lasting positive difference for countless students over the years through their time, their advocacy, and their support. We thank the Denny family for their ongoing support of Shawnee Mission Schools and celebrate with them as they receive this recognition from the university. Congratulations, Dr. Denny, to you and the entire family. <laughs> this honor is a little different for a principal, but we're very proud of Brian Watson. He's a principal at Tomahawk Elementary School for us. He's been presented the Mark Cahill Chippa Award, and I'll mention to you in a minute what that means, for, outs for officiating excellence as a part of the Sonic Great American Basketball League <laughs> Honors Program. He is honored for having exemplified the CHIPA criteria, which stands for communication, hustle, in position, and positive attitude. Watson is honored for his officiating work at the youth, high school, and college level. One of our elementary principals, Brian Watson. The Kansas, go right ahead. The Kansas Association of Middle School Administrators They've recognized Hawker Grove as the 2016 Middle School of the Year finalist for the state, and Indian Hills as the 2016 Exemplary Middle School. These schools will be recognized at the upcoming Kansas Association of Middle School Administrators Spring Conference luncheon in May. Five Shawnee Mission schools were named Governor's Achievement Award recipients for being among the top performing schools in the entire state. The honor was awarded to Corinth, Mill Creek, Ray Marsh, Westwood View, and Shawnee Mission East for their performance on the state assessments taken in the 14-15 school year. Shawnee Mission students earned multiple honors at the Skills USA Kansas State Conference. Sam Hoops and Ethan Hulke, were, who are enrolled in the Shawnee Mission Culinary Arts Signature Program, earned first place honors in competition events. The Greater Kansas City Science and Engineering Fair awarded dozens of honors to Shawnee Mission students. Many of the top honors, including two grand awards, were presented to Shawnee Mission students. As we saw featured in the video earlier, Rennie Mall received a grand award. Biotechnology Signature Program student Benjamin Dethridge also received a grand award at the Metro-wide event. They earned an all-expense pay trip to the 2016 Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. A team of Rose Hill students are grand prize honorees in the National <laughs> DuPont Challenge. They are honored. Okay, I thought maybe I said something wrong. You're no, laughing at the picture there. Nice. Okay. <laughs> they are honored for a competition entry that focused on raising awareness about skin cancer prevention. As winners, they receive prizes and will be part of a celebratory event at their school this year. Their teacher, Travis Myers, and instructional coach Brandy Leggett will be able to attend the 2017 National Science Teacher Association Conference as a result. You may also remember hearing about a team of fifth graders from Rose Hill who received a Toshiba National Science Teacher Association Explora Vision recognition 
for a 3D printer project in which they were designing a human liver transplant. We are proud that our elementary students are being, by the way, that was fifth grade. <laughs> we are proud that our elementary students are being recognized at the national level for their science, technology, engineering, and mathematics achievements. Speaking of STEM, our project Lead the Way students were recognized for the outstanding work at the Metro-wide Metro Project Lead the Way Senior Showcase. Drew Brooks and Nicholas Fowler received a top five innovative award. Alec Antrim and Remy Gordon received a top 10 engineering design contest honor and the Shawnee Mission School District was recognized for 10 years of participation in the Project Lead the Way program. This coming weekend, the Shawnee Mission School District will celebrate academic achievement at the 54th Annual Research and Development Forum sponsored through the generosity of the Rainier family. The event, which will be held on April 30 and May 1 at Shawnee Mission West, will recognize exceptional work in the areas of career and technical education, science, visual arts, and performing arts. The event concludes with a ceremony at 3 p.m. on May 1, which will also be streamed on the Shawnee Mission School District website. Earlier this month, the Shawnee Mission School District celebrated the official groundbreaking for the new Ryan Benninghoven Elementary School. This construction project was made possible through the bond issue approved by voters in 2015 and joined several projects already underway in the school district. Dr. Southwick, can you mention to us briefly an update on how those construction projects are proceeding? I'd be glad to do that. <clears throat> and also I want to take time to, uh, as Dr. Hansen has, is to thank um, the patrons of the Shawnee Mission School District to give us an opportunity to revitalize our facilities across this entire district. Center for Academic Achievement continues to go up. If you have not driven by 71st and Antioch, I would ask that you do that. Uh, we've got roof on building, glass. Uh, if Mr. Robinson was here, I'd argue with him. I said we'd be enclosed by about the second week of May, and he argued with me, but we think we're gonna be enclosed by about the second week of May, so shame on him. Um, we hope to be able to uh, work with the board uh, potentially in May at the May meeting and maybe do a hard hat tour of that facility. So uh, we're gonna keep working on that. Once Dunn says it's safe for you to be in the building, we're gonna get you there. Elementary schools, all three of those continue to come out of the ground at great progress. We finally got our, our site problems taken care of at Crestview with respect to the rock that we hit. Uh, but we've got walls and, and roof structure and going on at all three of the elementary schools, so great progress is there. Um, Dr. Henson said we did the groundbreaking for Benninghoven School. We did take the bids last week. Mr. Robinson and I went down to J.E. Dunn and sat through the process where all of the bidders, uh, and we had, we had good bids and, and plenty of bidders uh, across all of, of our um, areas of work. So we're gonna present that to you tonight for your approval. Uh, so we're excited about getting that fourth elementary school underway. We're now gonna shift gears and begin to work towards summer projects that'll take place over the summer. Um, another one of those would be uh, transforming a library at North into what we're gonna call um, a learning commons. And so we've got that bid on tonight as well. The last piece of it is, is that we uh, are gonna move into full gear with the aquatic center and also the stadium uh, renovations at South and hopefully in the upcoming months we'll be bringing those designs and, and also some of those bids to you so you can approve them when we get started so continues to be uh, great for the Shawnee Mission School District great story as we move forward and, and renovate our facilities and bring new facilities that help us meet our mission so um, it's a fun job for me to present but I would tell you that there are a lot of people across the district that are working hard every day to coordinate um, these facilities. I just get to share the good information, but a lot of people in the Shawnee Mission School District that are behind the scenes that really deserve the credit. So, Thank you, Dr. Southwick. So with all that great news, let's talk about some news that's not quite so great. So this is the <coughs> second time you'll, you'll hear this this evening. It was announced last week in relation to the state uh, fiscal, uh, I'll call them woes, that potentially uh, there could be a, an, an approximate cut to K-12 to the tune of $57 million. Uh, certainly we don't know if uh, that's going to come true or not, but that is public information. 
if that occurs, we don't know exactly how that pie will be sliced. We do know, however they slice the pie, it will be multiple millions of dollars of loss of revenue to the Shawnee Mission School District. And again, how the, the pie is really sliced will determine if that's three million, if that's six million, what that really looks like. But it will be significant. So certainly stay tuned uh, to what happens with the state uh, fiscal picture. Then a part of the question becomes when, uh, if that occurs, when will those reductions really start? It will also remind you uh, that we are facing uh, millions of dollars of increased cost as well. Uh, we had another meeting today uh, with our transportation provider, and they continue to push uh, extremely hard for a 20% increase, which is, I believe, over a million dollars for us. We've talked to you about the increase in utility cost, uh, those costs that we really don't control. So I don't have a, a bright picture to, to paint for you at all in relation to uh, finances. We're prepared as much as possible for what might occur. Um, but as we look toward the future, we, don't, we do not see any immediate uh, relief to this situation. So we continue to look at the issue of how do we become uh, more efficient. Um, I don't have any, any glowing things to say to you in relation to new revenue. So how do we do more with less? That's the issue that we continue to face. As you know, we faced that for a number of years, and certainly that picture is not currently changing. So we'll keep you informed as we know. Um, when we know that information, uh, that's gonna be a great question right now and when might occur. So the difficulty of sitting here at an April board meeting, announcement coming out last week with a number of 57 million that could occur, um, and then certainly not any additional revenue. Uh, there's a looming uh, decision by the Kansas Supreme Court, as you know. So uh, the oral arguments are May 10 court could render a decision whenever they so desire in that process. We would anticipate maybe the end of May, into June. Uh, it's really at their discretion when that decision is rendered. So fiscally, uh, there's so many things in question right now. Uh, unfortunately, all of those questions, uh, all those potential answers are negative. Uh, none of those include any increased uh, revenue right now for the Shawnee Mission School District. And so uh, coming to us from Topeka uh, in relation to additional revenue, um, the best case scenario, the very best case scenario is flat funding. Remember in relation to millions of dollars of increased cost, even if there's flat funding. I know I'm being repetitive, but if there's a $57 million cut, and again, depending how it's sliced, you know, we're getting into a situation where there's uh, significant millions of dollars if there's a reduction and with increased cost that we have to figure out how to make up in, in some form or fashion. So uh, that remains our challenge. Tremendous amount of uncertainty in the process of what might occur and when that might occur. Be happy to answer your questions. So that's why we want to start with all the positive right. first <laughs> before we got to that. But I simply don't have anything positive to say about the fiscal picture. Thank you, Mrs. Goodburn. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Henson. Okay, we're on to C1, which is a presentation from the Shawnee Mission Education Foundation. I would call Ms. Kim Hinkle, Executive Director, to the stand. Thank you, Mrs. Goodburn. Thank you, Dr. Henson, for allowing me to go right after that depressing news. <laughs> <laughs> Later this evening, you will consider expanding Project Lead the Way. The foundation enthusiastically supports this important STEM initiative and voted in our last board meeting to allocate $45,000 to the district to help with the computer science expansion to each of the five high schools. We are pleased to offer support for the purchase of updated video cards for computer programming modules, along with teacher laptops and Android tablets for the students who will be programming and testing. We applaud the innovative teaching and learning of our educators and students and are pleased to partner with you on this endeavor. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, we move to D1, open forum. Let me read this. At the beginning of each regular business meeting, the Board of Education provides an open forum as an opportunity for public comment on school district issues. Agendas are published in advance to notify the community of the topics under consideration. Patron comments are welcome, but those wishing to speak to an issue not included in the agenda will not usually receive a response during the meeting. 
the board president will place a time limit on each speaker. So tonight we have three, so I'm going to say three to five minutes. And um, if you could please keep your comments at three to five minutes, I will give you a, at four minutes, I'll give you a little high sign. And at five, I'll say that's it. So um, anyway, okay. Uh, first speaker tonight is Jay Humfeld. Good evening. First of all, I didn't know I was going to have my business put out in front of everybody here, so this is kind of interesting for me. Um, I don't have a speech prepared for you. I just have a few talking points. I've tried to role play it in my head all day how I wanted to go about it. So please forgive me as I look down at my notes here a little bit. About uh, six to eight weeks ago, I called the school district. I don't remember who I talked to. Said that I was planning on moving. How is this going to affect my kids? Uh, they're currently attending, my daughter's currently attending Crestview Elementary. They said as long as I stayed within the district, I would not have an issue with my daughter coming back to Crestview or my son. With that information, I bought a house a mile and a half away from where I was residing at that time. Last week, I attended kindergarten roundup at Crestview Elementary School, and the next day I received an email saying that my son was not allowed to attend that school because I was out of the zone. However, my daughter, who's in the same residence as I am, and my son, is more than welcome to return next year. I don't understand how that can be fair. I understand that there is a limit on room uh, because the Crestview is currently working in that temporary building, but how am I going to explain this to my daughter who was destroyed when I told her that we were moving, but then I told her she could continue to go to Crestview? How am I going to tell my son that those two can't go to the same school? Why should I have to split up my children? Now, I am closer to Neiman, so technically Neiman is my, my home school, okay, and I understand that. But under no circumstances is my ex going to allow my children to go to Neiman. And if anybody in here has a spouse, know that I'd rather battle you than my ex on that, that, uh, that issue. <laughs> so what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to, to take a look at the rules. I understand that the rules are in place, but there's exceptions to rules. Don't punish them because I made a decision to move into a house instead of an apartment a mile and a half away from my residence, and now my kids either have to be separated or have to move to a different school. I don't think it's fair to them. Um, I, I just don't think it's fair in general. This isn't some random child that I'm moving to the district and asking you, hey, can I, my child please come to your school? It's a sibling that lives under the same roof. I've probably ruined a few people's day the last couple days when I've called and I got these news and, and they had to see the, the hot-headed temper I have. So if I talk to any of you, I apologize for that, but I was just being a protective father. But I'm bringing it all the way to the board because I don't feel that this is fair and uh, I would really appreciate you guys to reconsider that and allow my, my five-year-old son to attend the same school as his sister. My sister is not a problem, or my daughter is not a problem at Crestview. You can call Mr. Bartell and ask him how Talia, her name is Talia Humfeld, how she is as a student. She's in good standing. She's one of the, the her tests and the Dibble score is one of the highest in her class. She's not a disciplinary problem. She's not a bad student. Neither is my son. So I'm asking you to have a little bit of compassion and, uh, and, and vote yes. <laughs> Any questions? No questions. Thank you. I take that as you agree with me. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our second speaker tonight is Larry Meeker. Thank you and uh, good evening. I want to address the issue of changing art schedules and planning time for teachers in the grade schools that you're considering. Uh, I think by all it is viewed as a diminishing of the arts program itself. And I think others will come before you either have or will in the future and speak to the importance of arts education for children. Uh, there's a great body of scientific knowledge on that and I'm not going to speak to that. Rather, I want to speak to the economic impact of this going forward in our community. I lead an economic development course at Western New Mexico University every year. And there's a big difference in how business is done in this century versus last. In the 20th century, economic development was about landing businesses in your community. And if you had jobs, people came. In the 21st century, the capital in companies is different. It's not land, machinery, and equipment. It's intellectual capital. And today, we're finding increasing numbers of businesses who are following the talent. And that means the job of economic development and the job of you in the school system 
is to attract and retain the brightest people you can get to move to this area. And attracting and retaining them depends on quality of schools, it's quality of life, it's a whole basket of things. Johnson Countyans know this from their history. We did that in the 20th century, and that's why people simply even moved across the state line from, from Missouri. I talked to somebody recently who was involved in corporate site selection. And one of the things you'll learn in basic economic development is the first thing a company does in trying to look for a new place is try to cross, uh, cross as many people off the list as they can quickly because they want to narrow it down to those few who will ultimately be good prospects. I understand Kansas is being crossed off those lists for a variety of reasons today. But you're a part of that here as well as the school board. Every little thing we do to diminish the quality of life, the quality of education, is one more notch against somebody moving here and saying, I want to bring my talent here and the businesses that follow that talent. And that's critical to our future. So what you do in this is goes beyond just simply the children and their education. It goes to those who move here because of what you're doing in arts education. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, our final speaker is Megan Gerbrandt. Sorry, I hope I got that right. Hi, my name is Megan Gerbrandt and I'm a senior at Shawnee Mission West and about three weeks ago, I think on April 7th, I emailed all of you about um, Debbie Allen's position. She's the Performing Arts Resource Specialist and this year her position was defunded. And as a student and a future music teacher, um, I think it's very important that we keep that position because she has such an effect on the program. And I've noticed that this year since we did not have her, she coordinates all the concerts and everything that music teachers don't have time for because they're very busy because their job goes beyond the school hours. There's a lot of planning and working that goes on beyond that. And um, I just think it's really important. And maybe since you're just, you're not seen in the schools, you don't see the effect it has, but um, as a student, I see the importance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We move to the approval of minutes. E1. So moved. Second. Thank you, Dr. Denny. Thank you, Ms. Bisfield. Uh, is there any discussion? No. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Okay, uh, F1, the adoption of the agenda. So I would moved. Move for <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Oh, okay, I'll second. Second, thank you, Ms. Sela. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion carries 7-0. G1, uh, approval of routine business by consent. I move approval of routine business by consent. Second. Thanks, Ms. Neighbor. Thank you, Mrs. Mack. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Okay, with that, we move down to action items. P1, Dr. Henson. Annually, we approve our uh, school fee schedule, and so currently 16-17 school year, going to ask uh, Mr. Russell Knapp if he would come forward, present the fee schedule this evening, please. Good evening. As Dr. Henson said, this is the fee schedule for 16-17. These are additional fees that you, uh, that you will approve for next year, and you've already previously approve a lot of the course fees that are embedded in the program of studies that you approved back in probably January or February. So I wasn't going to, I don't have plans on going fee by fee, so if you have any that I don't touch on, please ask about. Um, so I was going to start with the food service meals. As you know, the USDA sets the limits on what our lunch prices are. They did, when they went through that calculation, they did a ca uh, calculate an increase. But we asked for a waiver, so those fleas will stay flat for next year. So uh, the only increase that you see is for adult breakfasts and lunches and visitors as well. Okay. Um, 
parent pay, bus transportation. This is what the parents pay that travel less than two and a half miles. As Dr. Henson mentioned, we still do not have a contract for next year and they're asking for a 20% increase. What we generally have done in the past is whatever that contract increase, it's usually been around two, two and a half percent, we, we would increase this fee that same. So what I did here is I put a range and I capped it at 10%. So when we know when that contract is finalized, uh, if it's 20% increase, we won't pass that on. We'll cap it at 10%. So somewhere in this range, we'll establish that fee, but I wanted to present that range to you so we don't have to come back at a later time. Okay. Um, the, uh, again, I'll just put the participation activity fee. We left that flat at $75. That's one that we share between the building and the district. So the building keeps 40 of that. 35 of it comes over to the districts, which we use to offset some of our supplemental pay, our coaches' salaries. And then the textbook fee will remain at $80 at the secondary level, and it remains zero at the elementary. So the consideration of this fee, if you pass it tonight, the elementary schools will still have no all day kindergarten fees and no textbook fee. Any questions? Yes. In the past when we've had uh, bus fees go up and you looked at 2%, did we, didn't we have some multiple year contracts there where it, it was a gradual raise? Are they asking for that for one year? Yes. Mm -hmm. they've, they've come to us and um, they're having a hard time finding bus drivers and they say it's probably because of the hourly rate that uh, they pay for our contract. Dr. Southwick can address that question as well. Mr. Robinson and I have worked over the past several months with the first student and one of the issues is that the contract that was established um, and we're, um, we're in our second year, we'll be in our third year next year, was a five-year contract with a two and a half percent increase each of those years with an opportunity to renew that for another five years. So it could have been a 10 year contract. Um, this year, um, last week we were 36 drivers short of where we needed to be. And one of the miscalculations from for student was when they set the contract, we were at about a five and a half to six percent unemployment and that's dropped to in the, the mid to low twos. Um, so that obviously we've got a lot of people that would be driving a bus now that are, have sought other employment and have gained that employment. The other issue is is that they set their rates based upon an hourly wage of $14 an hour. And um, they also serve Olathe and when they renewed their contract last year they went to $16 plus per hour. So you can obviously see that anybody that wants to drive a bus can drive just a few miles down the road and can do that for a couple of dollars more an hour. Um, the $16 per hour is really in line more with what the market is across the metro area. Um, so they're having to come to us. Um, and, and we talked early on, your, your issue was wages to be able to secure drivers. So. Um, they're asking for this increase. We've, I've asked them specifically of the amount of money that will go to drivers and of the million, about million dollars that we'll have all, but about 50,000 will go to pay drivers. Uh, the 50,000, the other 50,000 will go uh, as a part of their operation. Um, we are still working with the contract with them. We, uh, one of the issues we've looked at because of the problems we've had this year is some pretty extensive liquidated damages per day, per route, uh, that we believe will provide them incentive if we're going to up our contract to be more in the market, then we wanna make sure that we have incentives and they have incentives um, to make sure they provide the service for us. We've been very honest with them. Um, if we were in a position where we could have known in October what we know now, we probably would have bid it out and looked for another contractor. It's literally impossible once you get in the spring to do an RFP and have somebody bring 200 buses into the community. So been very clear um, as we work towards uh, that contract that we'll most likely bring to you in May. 
um, that if the service is not where we think it should be in October of next year, we'll be coming to you with an RFP to, to look for services in other places. So long story to get to your question, 20% this year, probably 4.3 the next year, and 4.3 the next year if we get that far. They ask us for a 27% increase and we just told them no. And so I think what they're gonna try to do is load that over the next three years and they're gonna take a bigger bite out of it um, than what, what they really wanted to do. So we don't like it, um, but we're applying the pressure on them to make sure that if we, if we pay this increase, we get the service that we need. Thank um. you. Any other questions? Move, for, move approval. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Second. Thank you, Ms. Sela. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. All right, P2, Dr. Henson. I've asked Mr. Lane to rejoin us uh, tonight. He's going to explain to you the Cisco <coughs> Wireless Network Equipment and Licenses proposal that's before you this evening. Good evening. <clears throat> As part of our strategic plan, one of the things we looked at when we were early on constructing that was to make sure that district data infrastructure was up to snuff, that it would uh, offer both capacity and bandwidth and reliability for the student one-to-one -one devices uh, in the immediate term, as well as making sure that we're viable for the long term. A, a vital part of the networks that the district supports are our wireless networks. Uh, the vast majority of our devices today are wireless in nature. And so we come to you tonight as uh, part of the strategic plan out of uh, budgeted dollars, capital outlay dollars that are in the ICT budget line. Uh, capital outlay, again, only for those things that you can you know, go out, touch, grab, whatever, um, to upgrade and increase the capacity, the bandwidth, and the reliability of the wireless networks. There's some strategic pieces here. There's also a couple of tactical pieces here in that Cisco is a brand that is different from what we're using today. Currently, we have an Aruba wireless network in place. At Trail Ridge, we have done a number of proof of concepts to see who's offering the best possible in the current market and <clears throat> at, the, at the most recent iterations of the standards for wireless. There's a whole bunch of numbers and letters I could throw at you that would probably make me sound really, really smart, and you would want to, what was all of that? The ones to keep in mind are anything that deals with 802.11, deals with wireless networks. We're most concerned about the standards that deal with 802.11 AC, which is high speed, high capacity, um, high concentration wireless networks. Right now, our networks are kind of capped at their, their capacity or whatever. So these proof of concepts gave us an opportunity to look at different vendors to see how they competed, how well they did in 802.11 C. We went through, we looked at Aruba stuff, we looked at Ruckus, we looked at I knew I was going to, I should have listed them here. One that escapes me, and then Cisco was another one we looked at, and Cisco came out as being the best. They offer us a couple of advantages that others don't. They're already ready with their Wave 2 stuff. Uh, there's Wave 1 and Wave 2 of 802.11 AC. Wave 2 offers an even uh, greater increase in capacity bandwidth, but it also offers some infrastructure options that are attracted to us in that they don't necessarily require two wired drops to each access point to achieve those higher bandwidth capac and capacities and efficiencies. We can get by with a single drop. In new construction buildings, the two drops at one time is probably not as big a deal, but going back and retrofitting buildings where the infrastructure and the wireless plan already exist to back and pull another wire uh, can be expensive to retrofit building that way. So this gives us an opportunity to, to meet those strategic goals out of capital outlay dollars that we've already planned to spend for infrastructure purposes and move us down the road where we have higher capacity greater bandwidth, more reliability, and we think uh, hopefully in a growing school district where we have more students coming in, more devices coming in, it also future-proofs us just a little bit so that we don't have to go back and deal with all the wired infrastructure pieces immediately. We can continue to concentrate on how do we meet the needs of the new students coming in, because as we know, the dollars we have to do that with aren't necessarily coming in in, in greater quantities. So that's what this, what this is in front of you tonight. I think the key things you to remember are that these are capital outlay dollars. <coughs> these are dollars that were planned to be expended for infrastructure purposes, and it meets some of our strategic uh, plan goals that we already have in place. And I'd stand for any questions you might have. 
Mr. Lane, would you mention E-rate funding to the board, what that really means, please? Yes, sir, thank you. So E-rate funding, we will, we will apply for any and all E-rate funding that we're eligible for with this equipment. Much of the hardware that is in here, we will apply for E-rate funding. As a matter of fact, we've already applied for E-rate funding for, for this equipment to make sure we meet the deadline. Um, but things in here like licensing, those are not E-rate eligible services, so the district incurs the full cost. If our E-rate reimbursement remains the same, we can recover up to 60% of the cost of some of this equipment so that we can get as many as 60% of those capital outlay dollars back, assuming E-rate approves and then funds the purchase. So E-rate funding is a federal funding source. The percentage is based on, I'll call it your poverty level, level in the school district that determines your percentage, which can change on, a, on an annual basis. It can. It's based on free and reduced lunch rates. Move approval. Second. Second. Thank you, Dr. Denny. Thank you, Ms. Neighbor. Did I hear that over there? Sorry, I'm trying to find my place on the Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank Mr. You. Lane, before you leave the podium, yes, uh, an, an assignment and a compliment, and, and Mrs. Neighbor had talked about this as well earlier. Um, you run a massive uh, network. So the assignment, uh, really, in the entire metropolitan area, would like to know if there's any other network from any other entity, any other employer that is connected to more devices than what we have in the Shawnee Mission School District. Okay. And so I want to compliment your team for managing the complexity of 30,000 plus devices that you manage on a regular basis. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, P3, Dr. Henson. At a previous board meeting, you had approved components. Uh, what we have before us tonight, I've asked Dr. Atha to mention uh, to you tonight to bring the contract, and he'll explain the details of this contract with SunGuard and the complexities of what this issue also means to us. Dr. Atha. Good evening. Last month, as you recall, uh, you approved the purchase of SunGuard K-12 to provide products and services to implement a new business, finance, and human resources software system in the Shawnee Mission School District. This much needed software will replace and update our current system that has been in place since 1999. Tonight we are asking you to approve the master software license maintenance and service agreement with SunGuard K-12. This contract as negotiated over the last month will protect and benefit the Shawnee Mission School District and guide us through a rigorous implementation process. The implementation process will cover a span of 12 to 18 months with 306 full days of training spread out between the business, technology, and human resources department. Keep in mind these folks have a full-time job while this implementation process is going on. So it was real important that these departments see a need for this implementation and to adopt, adopt this software, and they do. They were actively engaged in the process from the beginning till now in the selection process, and their input was weighted heavily, and they're ready to meet the challenge over the next 12 to 18 months. With this said, it's without reservation that I recommend you approve the Master Software License Maintenance and Service Agreement with SunGuard K-12 as presented. <coughs> Questions? So moved. Second. Ms. Neighbor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bisfield. Yes. Anyone have any discussion? discussion I was here when people soft came on board <laughs> it is now very antiquated so this is a, a very positive move and I think it took us just about as long when we started with people soft as it will with this implementation so it's a lot of hard work but I know we have some great staff and some uh, super uh, support people to get this done Thank you, Mrs. Neighbor, for pointing that out, and Dr. Ath has pointed out. This is a major transition mm -hmm. of the HR suite purchasing our business and finance. It is a significant investment of, of human capital as well. 
12 to 18 month process. So we're not gonna snap our fingers and it goes away. We're gonna run parallel systems for a period of time. It's a very significant issue. And I'd like to acknowledge our staff in keeping PeopleSoft running through the years. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to keep a system going when it becomes a little bit antiquated. And uh, that's a tribute to, to, good, to a good staff that, that keeps things going. And I think they're ready to implement this new software. I just have one question. Under exclusions in this contract, it says that we shouldn't use non SunGuard components. And then a little bit later on, I think we have the right to use Kronos. Is that kind of, is it compatible? Yeah, it's, it is, and it's an IBM product, and it's something that we've used in the district before. And I've just about exhausted my level of expertise, so I may have to call on Drew Lane to get any more depth. So Cronus is our timekeeping system and it dumps into literally, if you will, uh, this system. Okay. And so that's a part of the cooperative agreement between SunGuard and, and Cronus as well that it can feed in or, or we call it dump into. So anything you want to add to or take away from that, Cronus, Mr. Lane? Cronus is one piece. The other one to keep in mind in the contract here is an item from IBM called Cognos. And Cognos is a data, data mining and dashboard utility for, for this. Uh, both, we have assurances, are absolutely okay. okay. And I, I misunderstood you. I thought you said Krognos, and, and uh, that is the IBM product. Okay. Kronos I've worked with for many, many years. I just know the name. <laughs> quick, quick question. Is this treated as capital outlay? Or what, what line yes. Yeah. This will be funded out of capital outlay exclusively. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Okay, we have now uh, P, oh, P12, P12. It's actually P4. Four. It shows up differently on, on oh. your agenda, and I think the official P4. agenda from uh, yeah. Mrs. Yeah. Wintering. So yeah. um, with that, Mrs. Uh, Goodburn, um, Dr. Southwick shared <coughs> a little bit earlier, but he'll share some more detail in relation to uh, the construction contract for Ryan Benninghoven, you'll recall we approved an initial phase and now the actual construction of the building. So, Dr. Southwick. Little clarification, this is the second phase of this work. Previously, you all had approved uh, $1,193,902, which basically let us get a jump start on two areas of that construction project. The earthwork excavation site work could begin and then as you remember on our other elementary schools, because of the demand for precast walls right now, we wanted to get that order in quickly. It's very important that we have those things prepared and ready to go up um, to keep our construction moving. So you had, you had already approved that amount. Um, we do have a guaranteed maximum price associated with the rest of the work from JE Dunn, including their fees of $16,470,526. That's what we're asking that you approve tonight. And just as a reminder, J.E. Dunn is our construction manager at risk. And when we have an at-risk process, they give us a guaranteed maximum price with the contingency that's built into that for those things that are unseen. And if we, uh, Mr. Robinson and I look at that as our money. Um, we watch that very closely, how they spend it. At the end of the project, if that uh, money's not spent, it comes back to us. So that also is included in this amount. So the, um, if you approve our 16,475,26 tonight, that'll be a guaranteed number from JE Dunn. If you add that to what you'd previously approved, our guaranteed maximum price from Dunn right now for Rain Benninghoven is 17,664,428. But again, you're just taking action for approval tonight on 16,475,26. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Denny. Second. Thank you, Ms. Sila. Um, any comments or discussion? Ready? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. I would like to mention too that that bid was favorable. It was 
a little bit lower than what we saw the other buildings come in at, so we're encouraged by that. Um, we happen to bid that at a good time. Okay, P5. Yes, P5 is uh, we've had conversations over the last year about, and as a part of our bond issue, about trying to transform our libraries or media centers, as we've called them in the past, to bring them more up to date, to bring them more as a part of the 21st century. So we had an opportunity. Uh, Bob's been working with um, Sunny Mission North High School over the last year to look at design of a flexible space that would look at um, changing it um, from a library to what I think we'll move forward to, to potentially call that a learning commons for students. So um, this is a project that uh, we're doing is a, a little bit of a pilot project at North. We anticipate um, that this will be a process that will follow with other media centers across the district. As a reminder, uh, the basis of our new uh, learning commons or media centers are designed um, uh, for our new elementary schools this way. So we're excited about this project. We took bids the other day and um, <coughs> we're asking for approval with Philco construction in the amount of $269,000. That work will be done this summer. So moved. Have a motion. Thank you, Ms. Sela. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Any discussion? Any I questions? Have, discussion? Yes. I have a quick question because we have talked about this, about doing this at other buildings. And so there, there isn't a set time frame. We're going to see how this works as a pilot project is what I hear you saying. Yes. And, and we, we actually were staged um, to look at a project at East as well. And then we had that um, librarian that um, retired last year. Mm -hmm. So that put us kind of behind a year. But absolutely, we'll move forward with projects like this. Um, we're going to have some lesson learns, you know. We're going to we're going to get some of it right, and some of it will have to be corrected. But it is a plan for us to move forward um, in our other media centers. I'd also like to mention that we've got about part of the um, process to make this conversion is around the flexibility of both spaces, and mm -hmm. furniture drives that. So we're going to be coming back to you uh, for approval of new furniture that will go into that space um, probably later this summer. And uh, we'll, we'll give you some details about that. But they're working on that part of the project. That's going to be around $100,000, we think. Uh, but it'll, we plan on having that space open uh, for students in the fall. That was actually my follow-up question, because I think several of us had gone to William Jewell mm -hmm. and saw the prior Learning Commons very similar. Center. And so it's yep. very exciting. Yeah, it is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, any other discussion? Questions? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> Motion carries 7 0. R1. I move that the uh, board recess into executive session in order to discuss matters relating to actions adversely or favorably affecting a student. We we'll reconvene at 8 05. Second. Thank you, Dr. Denny. Thank you, Mrs. Mack. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, we are recessed until 8.05. For those of you that are, for those of you that are still in the audience, I'll explain, explain what's happening. So, um, when a principal makes a recommendation, thank you for the microphone, when the principal makes a recommendation for a long-term suspension or, and or an expulsion, uh, that goes to a district hearing officer. So a hearing occurs in relation to that issue. If the decision by the hearing panel is, for a, is to uphold the long-term suspension or in some cases the expulsion, the parent and or guardian has the opportunity to appeal that decision. The decision is appealed to the Board of Education because the district hearing officer functions as the administrative hearing officer of the district. And so the board, when they, um, so a board subcommittee hears the appeal, and then the board subcommittee right now is going to present their recommendation to the Board of Education. Because it is an administrative recommendation, 
It is only the Board of Education that meets to decide what they're going to do with that administrative recommendation, which is made by the hearing officer of the district. I hope that makes some sense. So that's the law. Thank you. How are you? Thanks for being here. Yeah, appreciate it very much. Thank you.
Did the roof fall in? No. In the second one, on Sunday, he came to the autism walk, which we did with my son. Oh, did he? Yes. He and Suzette and Nova. <laughs> How far did he have to walk? Well, actually, we just walked. He walked with the car. We thought it was a we thought it was like a walk when we signed up. It was more like a family fun fair kind of thing. Mm. And then you walked around Katie and watched in <laughs> one of the buildings. And <laughs> I mean, that was it. Right. Of course, then the fire department was there, which was very nice. Thank you. You know, these guys are used to the loud noises. Okay, if they're pulling out of the parking lot, they start doing the sirens, and I'm like, oh, well, I've got miles to go with the woods because I can't stand loud noises. And so my son is walking with them to the car like this. Wow. Oh, boy, Okay. 
Okay, we are ready to start again. Uh, Mr. Stratton. I move, I move that the district uphold the decision of the Suspension Expulsion Committee regarding student E16-3. Second. Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Thank you, Mrs. Neighbor. Any discussion? Well, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Okay, that moves us on to T1, uh, board comments. Share one. Oh, okay. uh, earlier this month, Mrs. Mack and I had the opportunity to attend the National Association, no, National School Board Association meeting, and uh, we prepared our summary reports and provided them to the board. I just wanted to share publicly that uh, incredible benefit comes from that gathering. The benefit that I didn't anticipate that I saw when I attended was the opportunity to hear firsthand from districts, their leaders, as well as the, uh, the board and as the superintendent and staff, and then dialogue afterwards uh, about what they're going through in their uh, new programs, their facilities management. Um, that was the true benefit that I received. Uh, great programming ideas, great facilities ideas. I've shared that in the report, but I just wanted to say publicly that it was uh, well worth the time that we spent at that meeting. Thank you. Anybody else? I wanted to say that last week, um, Ms. Seela and I uh, attended the volunteer appreciation event in the district for the MVPs, um, a room full of them. Um, we were treated to the Indian Woods uh, Jazz Band as well. It was a really fine event, but I just was thinking as I was driving home that day, wow, it's a really nice event and there's um, lots of volunteers in the room, but just thinking about the amount of volunteers that are in our district daily, mm -hmm or um, you know, all the different PTA events and all the different schools, um, all the different booster clubs and, and just uh, parent volunteers going on choir trips and, and just an immense amount of volunteers that we have in our district, reading to kids, helping kids out. It's just, um, I just wanted to say a thank you. Um, I think I can speak for the entire board when I say thank you to all those volunteers that put in countless hours helping our kids succeed. Um, and also um, go on fun field trips and um, making sure our kids are safe and um, just wanted to say thank you. Anybody else? No? Okay, great. I move that the Board of Education recess to executive session in order to discuss personnel matters regarding non-elected personnel, to discuss matters relating to employer-employee negotiations and to discuss matters related to acquisition of real property and we will reconvene at 8.45, but no more business will be conducted following the executive session. Second. Thank you, Dr. Denny. Thank you, Ms. Bisfield. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you for attending tonight. I'll put you in there.